that he needs a lot of introduction. A lot of you know Tommy, but let me just mention a few of the high notes. And in case you don't read all the reviews, which we do, the Washington Post mm -hmm. has just named you top 10 of the year. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Woo! and then I'll go away, I promise. Um, graduate of the MFA program of the IAIA in Santa Fe. Wow. You still teach there, right? Wonderful. Currently living in Angels Camp or Oakland? Angels Camp. Good. Grew up in Oakland and we like to say in Taos as well. And um, this book is just getting acclaim beyond belief. And um, well deserved. We love the book. We hope you love the book. And uh, the way this will work is we're going to have a reading for about five to 10 minutes, questions 15 to 20 minutes, and then they'll be signing afterwards. Thank you again so much for coming. Thanks for your tolerance in terms of the close quarters. And without further ado, Tommy Orange. Louder. Uh, am I being heard by everyone from the back now? Okay, I, I think I can sustain that one. Um, so, this is a weird thing for me. Um, I used to spend a lot of time in this bookstore, just um, living here. When I did, in maybe 2006 and eight. Uh, I, wor I worked at the apple tree when it wasn't Lambert's, and Lambert's was over there. Uh, and uh, never in my wildest imagination thought that, you know, I don't even know author events happened here. Um, <laughs> but I never would have thought that this moment would happen. Um, I'm maybe going to ramble a little bit because my dad and sisters are late. <laughs> but I also kind of don't want them to hear it. So I'm, I may actually move on. Um, yeah, so my relationship to Taos um, in New Mexico is, is related to Sort of the reason why I exist, which is um, my mom, one, here. My dad is late. Uh, I think him being late and everyone always being late, I love. Um, because I think there's a relationship to time that has to do with the worldview that... Um, I think there, there are two ways of looking at, at what time should mean. And there's a, there's a Western view, a sort of corporate view of time. And there's an indigenous view. And a lot of other cultures have different views of time. And the indigenous view just happens to be a little more lax if you want to look at it from that kind of lens. But I like to give it a little more meaning than just like, we're lazy or we don't respect other people's relationships to agreements on when we'll meet. Um, I think it has much more to do with a fluid sense of your relationship with reality and, and this stringent idea that everyone needs to this, 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 and um, sort of fireable I got kicked out of high school because I was late. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <true story. laughs> um, I'm still delaying. But I feel ambivalent about it because I I actually don't want them to be here. I just I think I'll just I want to move on. And I'll just read. Um, and then we'll have questions. Thank you.
thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. So I'm reading from a chapter called Thomas Frank. That is my first and second name. Um, it came later along in the process. Anybody who knows me well knows it's me. Um, or like, you know, a fictional version of me. And um, <clears throat> I like fiction because you can sort of tell your truth and divert where you want to and um, nobody can necessarily pinpoint you and tell you which is which. Um, so I'm gonna, just going to read like five minutes from this and then I'm happy to take questions. Thomas was um, named after my uncle on my mom's side and Frank uncle on my dad's side, uh, but I, my author name is Tommy because uh, I never was able to make the transition from, from Tommy, which is like a kid's sounding name, um, I sort of have a kid face, or it's just been said in the New York Times, the profile that they did on me. <laughs> How am I in the back? Okay, I'll, I'll go from right. I'll just try to keep this right here. Before you were born, you were a head and a tail and a milky pool, a swimmer. You were a race, a dying off, a breaking through, an arrival. Before you were born, you were an egg in your mom who was an egg in her mom. Before you were born, you were the nested Russian grandmother doll of possibility in your mom's ovaries. You were two halves of a thousand different kinds of possibility, a million heads or tails, lip shine on a spun coin. Before you were born, you were the idea to make it to California for gold or bust. You were white, you were brown, you were red, you were dust. You were hiding, you were seeking. Before you were born, you were chased, beaten, broken, trapped on a reservation in Oklahoma. Before you were born, you were an idea your mom got into her head in the 70s to hitchhike across the country and become a dancer in New York. You were on your way when she did not make it across the country, but sputtered and spiraled and wound up in Taos, New Mexico, at a peyote commune named Morningstar. Before you were born, you were your dad's decision to move away from the reservation up to northern New Mexico to learn about a Pueblo guy's fireplace. You were the light and the wet of your parents' eyes as they met across that fireplace in ceremony. Before you were born, your halves inside them moved to Oakland. Before you were born, before your body was much more than heart, spine, bone, brain, skin, blood, and vein, when you just started to build muscle with movement before you showed, but bulged in her belly, as her belly, before your dad's pride could belly swell in the sight of you. Your parents were in a room listening to the sound your heart made. You had an arrhythmic heartbeat. The doctor said it was normal. Your arrhythmic heart was not abnormal. Maybe he's a drummer, your dad said. <laughs> He doesn't even know what a drum is, your mom said. <laughs> Heart, your dad said. The man said arrhythmic, that means no rhythm. Maybe it just means he knows the rhythm so good he doesn't always hit it when you expect him to. <laughs> rhythm of what, she said. But once you got big enough to make your mom feel you, <coughs> she couldn't deny it. You swam to the beat. When your dad brought out the kettle drum, you'd kick her in time with it or to her heartbeat, or to one of the oldies mixtapes she had made from records she loved and played to no end in your Aerostar minivan. <laughs> Once you were out in the world, running and jumping and climbing, you tapped your toes and fingers everywhere, all the time, 
on tabletops, desktops. You tapped every surface you found in front of you. Listened for the sound things made back at you when you hit them. The timbre of taps, the din of dings, silverware clangs in kitchens, door knocks, knuckle cracks, head scratches. You were finding out that everything makes a sound. Everything can be drumming, whether rhythm is kept or strays. Even gunshots and backfire, the howl of trains at night, the wind against your windows. The world is made of sound. But inside every kind of sound lurked a sadness. In the quiet between your parents, after a fight they both managed to lose. You and your sisters listening through the walls for tones, listening for early signs of a fight, for late signs of a fight reignited. The sound of the worship service, that building drone and wail of evangelical Christian worship, your mom speaking in tongues on that crest, on the crest of that weekly Sunday wave. Sadness because you couldn't feel any of it in there and wanted to, felt you needed it, that it could protect you from the dreams you had almost you had almost every night of the end of the world and the possibility of, of hell forever. You living there, still a boy, unable to die or leave or do anything but burn in a lake of fire. Sadness came when you had to wake up your snoring dad in church. Even as members of the congregation, members of your family were being slain by the Holy Ghost in the aisles right next to him. <laughs> Sadness came when the days got shorter at the end of summer, when the street got quiet without kids out anymore and the color of that fleeting sky. Sadness lurked. Sadness pounced, slid in between everything, anything it could find its way into through sound, through you. You didn't think of any of the tapping or knocking or drumming until you actually started drumming many years later. It would have been good to know that you'd always done something naturally. That there was too much going on with everyone else in your family for anyone to notice you should probably have done something else with your fingers and toes and tap, with your mind and time and knock at all the surfaces in your life like you were looking for a way in. Mm -hmm. That's good.